You, uh, you feel good? And remarkably, the answer might actually be yes. That's the goal. You might want to live long, but even more importantly, you want to live well. You may be familiar with images uh, like that that come across your uh, social media uh, or occasionally uh, across the television. Uh, they are all images uh, about one thing uh, and one thing only. Uh, they are all images about a just society. I was born into injustice. Any society that takes a little tiny baby uh, away from its mother, uh, when that mother is uh, totally able to bring up and love that child if uh, she's surrounded by uh, a caring and supportive community, uh, any society that takes that child away uh, is quite simply unjust. So perhaps that's why uh, this uh, cracked, mouldy, old uh, plastic sign uh, on the side of the road in Gosford uh, is a, a very analogue way uh, of trying to break into our digital minds uh, about the idea of a just society. Uh, I was really lucky. I was adopted into and brought up by a, a wonderful, caring family that uh, really, really went out of their way to make me feel wanted and loved and belonged. Uh, I grew up in a, in a country valley where uh, uh, I had all the things that uh, uh, little boys normally have toys of. Uh, I had my own real live horse and dog and tractor and truck and uh, uh, it was a great way to grow up. Uh, but there was, there was kind of one thing uh, in growing up in this valley that uh, I did struggle a little bit with eventually. And that was that there was a, a high level of familial identity. Uh, everybody was related to everybody else. And I can remember one of my neighbours referring to my grandfather, who was then long deceased, as my uncle. It was that kind of use of the surrogate uncle idea of relationship. Uh, and what I got from that was this grandfather that he was talking about kind of really wasn't my grandfather. Uh, and as a little boy, I, I can just remember feeling, oh, do I, do I actually really belong? I, I know I'm loved and accepted and wanted, but... Uh, but do I, I really belong? I remember having a, a, uh, a competition uh, with a nine-year-old friend. I was nine at the time. Little boys tend to have these competitions with one another. We just heard about masculinity. Uh, and the, uh, the idea uh, was that uh, uh, we were in an argument about who had lived, whose family had lived in the valley for the longest. Uh, and we went back through our, our lineage and eventually we found we had the same great, great, great grandfather. Uh, so it was a stalemate. It was the end of the argument. Uh, and then he delivered the decisive winning blow. Ah, oh, yes, but that doesn't count because you're adopted. And I can remember at a, as a nine-year-old beginning to think, well, what, what does it really mean to belong then? If I don't really belong here, if I don't really belong to this family, if I don't really belong to this valley, if I don't really belong to this community, if I don't really belong to this society, uh, what's it all about? Uh, and because I found it as an adopted person, beginning to sort of wonder about what it, was, what it was like to belong, beginning to wonder about whether this society that I lived in was just or not, uh, I, I found it really hard to sort of fit in and belong anywhere. So I, I, I ran away from school when I was 15, as early as I possibly could, and got a job in a butcher shop in Newcastle. A lot of my school friends left school at the same time at the end of uh, year 10 uh, to work at the BHP. Now, one such friend was a Torres Strait Islander boy by the name of Wayne. Uh, Wayne and I had been close at school. We played football together. He also had been adopted. Maybe that's what uh, drew us together. 
Uh, and so one of my jobs as an apprentice butcher every morning was to, uh, to go out to the front of the shop and to sweep the footpath. And uh, Wayne used to catch the bus out the front of the shop. So as I swept the footpath, uh, I would chat with my friend Wayne. Uh, he would get on the bus and go off to the BHP. Uh, I would come back inside. Uh, and this went on every morning. It was a bit like a bit of our ritual. Until one morning, and there was a new manager started in the shop. And I'd swept the footpath, uh, and I came back into the shop, and he, he stopped me. Uh, and he said, so, you talk to blackfellas, do you? Well, from that morning on, I waited till Wayne got on the bus uh, until I went out to sweep the footpath. That morning I made a choice uh, about fitting in rather than belonging. Because to fit in, you have to deny something of yourself. To fit into someone else's context, someone else's system, you have to give up something of yourself. And you are less of who you are when you fit in. Fitting in is, I have discovered, not belonging. So what was going on there? Well, really, what was going on there was a domination system. Uh, we all live in a domination system, no matter where we come from or who we are, and those systems uh, normally have five elements. They normally have a, an element of ethnicity, an element of, of gender, one of culture, uh, sometimes a religious element, sometimes an element of, of sexuality. And the domination system that we live in is uh, generally white, male, Western, nominally Christian, heterosexual. Yay! <laughs> I win. <laughs> but for every one of those boxes that you can't tick, it gets just a little bit harder to fit in. For every one of those boxes that you can't tick, uh, it gets a little harder to belong. And so we know, especially if you can't tick all of those boxes, that to fit in, something of yourself needs to be packed away, denied, perhaps it even dies. And somewhere deep, deep down inside, you feel that you don't belong as much. Uh, who among us are grandparents? Yeah, great, fantastic, isn't it? Isn't it the best thing in the world? And your grandchildren are the smartest, most beautiful grandchildren in the universe? Yes. <laughs> no, they're not. Mine are. <laughs> I have four. <laughs> I want to tell you about my oldest granddaughter, she's now nine, Isabella Rose. Uh, when Izzy was three, she could recite the periodic table. <laughs> Truly, she is the smartest grandchild in the universe. Izzy's superpower is autism. So sometimes, she does find it a little hard to fit in. She does find it a little hard to belong. Uh, on the day before she had her first day at school, she got in her school uniform and she took a selfie and sent it to me and said, uh, Pa, look at my school uniform. I'm not sure she knew really what a school uniform was, but she knew it was important and she had one and that was all that mattered. First day at school, she gets home, she rings me and says, Pa, everybody else has got the same uniform. <laughs> They want us all to be the same. And I'm an individual, she said. <laughs> Second and final day at that school. <laughs> 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 
Izzy decided that she was going to teach the class. <laughs> and her teacher said, Izzy, you've got to learn to fit in. And through the eyes of then a six-year-old, I learnt something that I think I already knew when I was a six-year-old. That fitting in is not belonging. A just society doesn't ask us to fit in. A just society asks us to belong. A just society doesn't ask us to change. A just society evolves to include. I was born into injustice. Will my grandchild, my grandchildren, our grandchildren continue? to live in a society that is unjust? Or will we create a society in which, uh, a society that can evolve so that people don't have to fit in, but so that they can belong? I want to take you just uh, for one very quick moment to another Izzy, one that's in the, in the media just at the moment, Izzy Falau. Now, no matter what you, you think about that issue, uh, what we have in, in stark relief there is the idea of competing rights and contradictory rights. On the one hand, we have uh, uh, someone who is, is claiming uh, religious freedom, the right to practice religion, uh, the right to speak about religion uh, in the way that he chooses to do, whether we agree with that or not. I'm very keen on a just society that allows uh, religious rights uh, because uh, I, I speak about things sometimes that the government doesn't like and I do that uh, motivated by my faith. Uh, I don't want any government legislating uh, uh, that I can't say things they don't like because uh, uh, of my faith. Uh, that's not a, a very healthy or happy society to live in. But on the other hand, we have the LGBTI community who have the right uh, to live in a society that is safe and welcoming and affirming, uh, who have the, uh, the right uh, to be and to belong. So what do we do? What does a just society do when rights are competing and contradictory? I think the answer to that lies at the absolute heart and foundation of this land. For 65,000 years prior to European settlement, the people of this place lived together. 500 nations, 800 languages, containing uh, different cultures, uh, different religious expressions, different music, different laws, different traditions. Now, okay, it wasn't utopia, it wasn't perfect, and there was conflict. Uh, but they found ways of resolving that conflict in the very DNA of the land that we stand on. There is a way to live together and to, to resolve these issues and to evolve a just society. Two things are necessary that we acknowledge we share a common humanity and that we share this common humanity in a common place. If we build everything on that foundation, then we will begin to evolve a just society. The Uluru Statement offered us a great gift and we are yet to receive that gift. We are yet to take it up. But when we return to the rock at the heart of our land and base all that we do 
and understand all that we are on the foundation that we share a common humanity in a common place, we will begin to evolve a just society. In order to do that, we all have to live in the same civic universe. We might think we do, but we don't live in the same civic universe. We went through a, a plebiscite and subsequent legislation not so long ago because there were some people who didn't live in the same civic universe as I did. I could get married. Uh, and about 10% uh, of the citizens of this nation, by law, could not get married. Now, okay, we, we dealt with that one, and, uh, and now LGBTIQ people uh, live in the same, at least, uh, civic universe under, under the uh, 1961 Marriage Act. That's great. But there are so many other situations where people do not live in the same civic universe. The gender pay gap is one. The moment we excised Christmas Island from our migration zone, we said to the world's most vulnerable people, you do not live in the same civic universe as I do. Uh, the laws that apply and protect me do not apply to or protect you. And if we look at the people on Manus and Nauru at the moment, we see the devastating consequences of what happens when people do not live in the same civic universe as we do. Not only do we have to live in the same civic universe, we have to live in the same economy. At the moment, we have an economy that is an economy of not enough. One of our politicians said not long ago that the disadvantage was looking over the fence and seeing that your neighbour had a jet ski and you didn't. Uh, and he's right. In the economy that we live in, he's right. That is what disadvantage is understood as because uh, it is a, an economy that says we do not have enough. We've got to get a, more of those, a bigger one of them, uh, another one of them. The opposite to poverty is not wealth. The opposite to poverty is enough. And until we live in an economy of enough, then we will never live in a just society. So we have to move our domination system from one that is based on five things that not everybody can fit into to a culture of belonging. And to belong, all we have to do is be human. Perhaps all we have to do is be a sentient being. And all we have to do is be willing to share a common place. To have a just society, all we need to do is ensure that we inhabit the same civic universe. To live in a just society, all we have to do is move our economic paradigm from one of scarcity to one of enough. It is then that we live in a just society. It's then we can all belong, we don't have to fit in. Because Happiness is a just society. Thank you so much.